Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 114. Thanks so much for joining me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, we have a special guest today. Joseph Asano is going to be here in about 15 minutes. Joseph is uh, one of the winners of the Rattle Poetry Prize. He's just a wonderful poet. He's author of five books of poetry, and they're just all outstanding. So musical and, um, and such rich richness to his voice. Um, but before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you love poetry too, so please make sure you click the like button if you haven't yet. I see some people already have on YouTube. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Over on Facebook, we are running as well. Um, click something to make sure that uh, you know that the, the companies know that uh, this is content worth sharing. That's kind of what we want to do here to make sure that we get reach and then people can enjoy the same wonderful poetry that you do. So please make sure you click and share and subscribe and all that good stuff. Now, as always, we like to begin with um, Poet Respond Live a little bit and talk to the poet of the day. Um, today is Sunday, of course, uh, October 17th, and today's poem is This Covering of Blue by Tanner um, Steining, I think I'd say, Tanner Steining, and um, let's call up Tanner and see if we can get him on the phone. Hey, Tanner, this is Tim with Rattle. You are live on the air. Oh, hi, Tim. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much. I'm so glad you could join me. Um, it's just a wonderful poem um, that you included today. And uh, do you want to just talk a little bit about what inspired the poem? What made it come to be? Yeah, so um, interestingly, my uh, day job is that uh, I'm a news reporter. Oh, really? uh, so, well, that's perfect for Poetry yeah. Spawn, then, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I've been kind of looking out for, you know, some things that uh, obviously lend themselves to poems. And um, I think that this was, was one of those instances, um, you know, uh, you know, Shatner's a, a, a very public figure, uh, you know, and I, I just think that, you know, the, the trip up there was, was remarkable in itself. And, and um, you know, it was just a moment of, of very public awe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm so yeah, glad that you uh, that you pointed out this. I hadn't I hadn't seen the um, you know the Shatner interview and, and what his, his remarks were afterward. But several people wrote poems about this. It's just such a great thing to record in poem form because it is such a poetic insight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, you know, I felt like it was a you know sort of you know as a poet we kind of look out for these things, but you know we certainly feel you know, like there was this sort of duty of, of vicariousness to, to kind of, you know, help interpret some of, some of the awe that we saw, you know, within Shatner, you know, on, on the TV screen and, um, you know, to kind of take it and, and repackage it, um, in a poem, uh, you know, so it was kind of a, it was a pretty obvious poetic project from, yeah, you know, from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. But I'm just glad that it could be recorded this way. You know, because I, I love looking back at the Poets Respond poems a year or two later and, and being reminded of stuff like this, which might fall through the cracks. You know, you might not think of it again. Um, but it's just such a great thing. There, there's this, um, the concept that's really about, it's called the overview effect, which um, which I kind of forgot about and then was reminded by Shatner. Um, and, and there's a great definition on Wikipedia, so I'm just going to read this for everybody at home. This is what they're talking about. The over, and this is based on a, um, a book by Frank White, um, The Overview Effect, Space Exploration and Human Evolution, is the book where he coined this term. But it's, it's something that um, a lot of astronauts all around the world, like Russian astronauts and you know, NASA astronauts, all felt and experienced. And here's the, it's a really great definition. It's almost poetry itself, too, just on Wikipedia. The overview effect is a cognitive shift in awareness reported by some astronauts during space flight, often while viewing the Earth from outer space. It is the experience of seeing firsthand the reality of the Earth in space, which is immediately understood to be a tiny, fragile ball of life hanging in the void, shielded and nourished by a paper-thin atmosphere. For some, or for, from space, national boundaries vanish, and the conflicts that divide people become less important, and the need to create a planetary society with a united will to protect this pale blue dot becomes both obvious and imperative. And I just love that, that, that William Shatner was able to, 
you know, articulate that himself and then and bring more awareness to it. When the um, when the uh, you know, the billionaires were going up in space, um, you know, a lot of people were upset that they were taking joy rides, you know, but I just kept thinking, too, that, you know, that's one of the things they need. Like they need maybe a, a DMT and they need, <laughs> need to fly in space and see the earth and the, and the you know, fragile ball that it is. So, yeah. 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 You know, it's incredible. And I, and I, I you know, I found it to be a moment where, you know, and, and I sort of have this in the poem when metaphor kind of sort of leaps out and subsumes language, um, you know, in the way that we saw with, with Shatner, you know, uh, and you can, you can only, you can only sort of communicate in metaphor, um, you know, and in superlatives. And um, so it was just amazing to see that. And, and again, you know, I felt certainly the sort of duty to pass on, uh, you know, this sort of very public awe, mm-hmm. you know, as I saw it. Yeah, well, you did a great job of capturing it here. Do you want to go ahead and read it, uh, this covering of blue? Sure. This covering of blue. And suddenly you're through the blue, William Shatner exclaimed after disembarking the space capsule, not as Captain Kirk, but as himself, a demure 90-year-old man, billionaire to his left, CNN camera positioned to his right, leveraged to capture the intimate moment. Shatner, head in hands, sobbing between bursts of inspired testimony about what it was like to bob briefly above the planet in Bezos's blue origin rocket. There was no need for metaphor this time. What you see is black, he said. Is that death? If so, he'd spent years rehearsing how to swim in its waters climb through its fabric into other dimensions. Captain Kirk had died three times, twice assured by alternate realities. Did Shatner mean that the infinite blackness was more than inhospitable, that in fact it was self-negating? Hours later, the newspaper said the brief 11-minute climb to the edge of space rendered the celebrated actor speechless. Yet, his speechlessness was made entirely of speech. The vulnerability of everything, this sheet, this blanket, he said, hands quivering, this covering of blue that we have around us. The other crew members doused themselves in champagne, frolicked and took pictures, while Shatner doddered with the weight of his own interiority. When he spoke, he spoke neither to Bezos nor the row of cameras. Our own fragility was what was so moving. And how isn't it to be thrust back out at what's thrust in us, spilling from utterance and gesture as they come to mean what they cannot by themselves? There was no need for metaphor. And yet, metaphor is what became of Shatner, his feet firmly on the ground in this singular life. I hope I never recover from this," he said. "Oh, Bill, we never do." Wonderful. And that was just a great poem. Uh, this covering of blue by Tanner Stenning. Thanks so much for joining us, Tanner. Thanks so much, Tim. Yep. Good night. So, uh, yeah, that was just a wonderful poem, and, and something that I just I encourage everybody to go and watch some of the interviews if you haven't seen them with um, William Shatner after he came back. There was one I think um, on CNN is the one I watched, and he was on for a good ten minutes talking about this experience that he had, and just how profound it is to think of this, you know, blue blanket that's comforting us and uh, and and the against the emptiness and cold black death of space is how I think he described it. Um, so let's go to uh, the second poem, though. We have a bonus poem this week. And this one is um, uh, by Mark Allen DiMartino. It's going to come out on Thursday. And um, I wonder if I can get it a little size, a little better. Um, so this is a Sestina for the Falling Autumn Light. And this is one of those poems for Poet Respond that was just, um, you know, I do consider the topic um, when I'm, you know, considering poems, what to publish. And um, but sometimes there's just a beautiful poem that fits the topic, but, but fits in in being timely, and this is one of those where um, you know you could publish this any time. It's not necessarily tied to the to the um, to the news necessarily, but this is news that's going on, and it was inspired by a news story. And so um, 
this is. Let me see if the uh, the screen view looks like that. There we go. Yeah, it's better. So um, this is uh, Sestina for the Falling Autumn Light, and I will read what um, Mark has to say here. Uh, this is Mark Allen Martino, who was the guest on Rattlecast number, I don't know, about a year ago, so it would have been around 60. Um, he's uh, living in Italy. Every October I begin to miss the fall colors of the mid-Atlantic region where I grew up. I don't get them quite the same way where I live now. After a weird, superheated summer, it looks like the fall colors have suddenly snapped back. Who knows how much longer we will get to witness their glory. And that is um, the note about this poem by uh, Mark Allen Martino, Sestina for the Falling Autumn Light. So we're going to play this and then we'll uh, get to today's main guest. Sestina for the Falling Autumn Light. Time strangles anything it strains to hold, tangles the whistle of a passing train into refracted pitches, a refrain as now recedes in squall. Tally the gold dust on the telescope, polish the trick mirror, your image flickers like a wick. Your image flickers like a candle's wick in time's dense mirror. What you cannot hold is all there is. Arrive, depart. The train warps through the station's prism, its refrain refracted coordinates. Fade to gold. The sun goes down like a child's metric. The sun goes down like a child's magic trick, trapped in the squall of a departing train to Nowheresville. This backbeat's crack refrain refracts the scene in its mad mirror's gold, pitch dark at rainbow's edge, its flaming wick, a fire no individual can hope to hold. A fire no individual can hope to hold awaits at rainbow's edge, a trigger a wick unraveling time. Strike chorus, refrain, backbeat, tempo, music. The faded gold of thought, our consciousness's greatest trick, clacking along indeterminately. Train clacking along indeterminately, train with no conductor, accumulate refrain of themes, associate music. Stick, wick, and flame, bound up together by some trick, evolutionary sleight of hand. Hold me, stroll with me through all this falling gold. Stroll with me through all this falling gold, no human eye could ever hope to hold. The trees are candles, incandescent, wick by wick, performing nature's magic trick. Their glitter wanes faster than any train, drains to the dregs its annual refrain. The brilliance of the wick is in its gold. Time's hat trick is to never miss your train. Find one small hand to hold. Chorus. Refrain. That was Mark Allen Martino once again with a Tuesday's poem, a preview of what we'll be posting there. Uh, Sestina for the Falling Autumn Light. And um, there was this article that he was referring to from the New York Times, which was what inspired this poem. Or no, from the Washington Post, I should say, that uh, peak viewing has finally set in for um, the Atlantic uh, leave, you know, the autumn season. So um, that is going to be Tuesday's poem. And now let us move on to our featured guest. I'm going to put up a splash screen and some music, and we will be right back with uh, Joseph Fasano.
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. As I mentioned, today's guest is Joseph Fasano, um, who is the winner of the 2008 Rattle Poetry Prize for Mahler in New York, which we'll hear in a little bit. Um, Joseph Fasano was a writer and educator. He studied mathematics and astrophysics at Harvard University before changing his course to study and earning a degree in philosophy with a focus on uh, philosophy of language after Wittgenstein. He did his uh, graduate study at poetry at Columbia, where he now teaches. Fasano is the author of the novel The Dark Heart of Every Wild Thing, uh, which was named one of the 20 best small press books of 2020. His books of poetry are The Crossing, praised by Ilya Kaminsky for its lush drive to live even in the darkest moments, Vincent, and Fugue for Other Hands, which won the Cider Press Review. Um, as already mentioned, he won the Rattle Poetry Prize, but he also serves on the editorial board of Alice James Books, and he is the founder of the Poem for You series, a digital space offering recitations for listeners' favorite poems by request. Um, he is a, also a songwriter, and his songs and performances can be found on his social media platforms. And here he is, uh, Joseph Fasano. Hey, Joseph, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's, it's good to be here. Good to see you, Tim. Yeah, it's great to see you. I think we met one time maybe at an AWP, since, uh, and, and that's about it. So it's really cool to, uh, to see you again. Yeah, I was saying, I, I think that uh, man, the first time we talked, and maybe the, maybe the last time we talked, was, uh, yeah, 2008, I think, when, uh, when you called me up and told me about that Rattle Poetry Prize. It was a great call to get. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I think you might be in 2008 the last person who actually answered the phone, <laughs> because cause people yeah, don't answer the phone from strange numbers anymore. So um, <laughs> it was a different time. Yeah, it definitely was. So do you want to start us out with a poem? Sure, I'll uh, I'll read that poem. Uh, so this is uh, Mahler in New York. I wrote this poem when I was 24 years old. I was living uh, in in Manhattan, and uh, I just started grad school. And uh, was listening to Mahler and and was experimenting with the with the form of the persona poem. So this is a, a poem that sort of is in the voice of Gustav Mahler and also uh, in some sense is not, which is to say in some sense is in my own voice. Mahler in New York. Now when I go out, the wind pulls me into the grave. I go out to part the hair of a child I left behind and he pushes his face into my cuffs to smell the wind. If I carry my father with me, it is the way a horse carries autumn in its mane. If I remember my brother, it is as if a buck had knelt down in a room I was in. I kneel and the wind kneels down in me. What is it to have a history a flock buried in the blindness of winter. Try crawling with two violins into the hallway of your father's hearse. It is filled with sparrows. Sometimes I go to the field and the field is bare. There is the wind which entrusts me. There is a woman walking with a pail of milk, a man who tilts his bread in the sun. There is the black heart of a mare in the milk, or is it the wind, the way it goes? I don't know about the wind, about the way it goes. All I know is that sometimes someone will pick up the black violin of his childhood and start playing, that it sits there on his shoulder like a thin gray falcon asleep in its blinders and that we carry each other this way because it is the way we would like to be carried, sometimes with mercy, sometimes without. Yeah, that was uh, Mahler in New York, the Rattle Poetry Prize winner from 2008 and just such a, a beautiful poem, like line for line. I, I remember, remember um, you know, reading it and just... Every line just stands out as a great line. And I, I'm really curious. It's, it's actually interesting because I don't know too much about Mahler and never looked it up. Like, and none of us did. I remember at the meeting, we were like, well, this, this is in the voice of Mahler. But what do we know about Mahler? I knew I know he moved to New York. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but, but it feels very personal and intimate, too. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how that poem came to be? You mentioned that you were working in, in uh, persona a little bit, which is something yeah. that you do regularly now, too. 
Um, yes. So, so how did the poem come to be, and, and why Mahler's voice, and and how <laughs> did that did that come out? It's so true. I was listening to to his his songs of of the earth, and so there was something about that that uh, uh, that, that 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 spurred this poem into being. At the time, I was studying with uh, two people who have now actually both passed on, uh, Mark Strand and Lucy Brock Broido. And, uh, you know, it might be interesting, the people who are, who are listening or will listen to this who, who know those poets will sort of know that if you, if you kind of put together some of the wild imagistic work of Lucy and, and what I used to and still love about Mark's uh, sort of uh, sort of slower tempos and pacing of a poem. I think those two things came together in my mind and sort of alchemized into the rhythms, the cadences, and the images of this poem. But yes, the persona uh, uh, allows, I think, the poet to access a part of himself that maybe he doesn't want to speak uh, uh, nakedly as. And so I think the poem uh, sort of Young as I was when I wrote this poem, I don't think I was ready to confront certain things uh, in my own psyche. And that actually served the poem uh, because I was able to come at it, uh, to tell it slant, as it were. Uh, and so I think all those factors came together. And then the sort of ineffable thing that always happens when you when you write a poem that you can't quite explain. Um, but I do remember uh, finishing this poem sort of rather quickly, tucking it away for a while and... Uh, revisiting it and and feeling like it had it had done something that I had wanted it to yeah it's one of those poems where you, you can't it's hard to put a finger on exactly you know it's 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 articulating the inarticulate and um and it, which is one of the things that made it stand out too um have you written other poems uh for Mahler or, or, in, or is it the only Mahler poem Mahler came and went with this poem mm -hmm. I I had uh, Schumann is a composer that I, I have a poem uh, sort of in his voice uh and I sympathize very much with his journey. And, and he, um, you know, had very, very interesting biography, somebody who who struggled uh, mentally and emotionally, um, these profound compositions, trying to find the beauty and the song in the suffering. Um, so I have a poem uh, in, in, in a voice uh, that is like his or, or, or sort of using his characters, really the way I should say it. Um, in my first book. And then I've written uh, several others in that voice as well. So composers, I, I very much sympathize with musicians, uh, music being the sort of pure uh, art form insofar as it is it is purely form. There is no denotative mu uh, meaning to a note. Uh, it gathers its meaning only by the form in which it's constructed in the context of other notes. So I think I'm, I'm I'm a little bit of a musician myself, but really sort of envious of, of that that kind of composer. So I, I, I channel them as often as I can. Yeah, and the metaphors stand out in that poem too. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about how you come to find metaphors, like the black violin of his childhood? Like, like there are lines like that that just, I mean, just stand out throughout your work, but, but you're really, you know, people have already mentioned how beautiful that poem is, and there's a beauty to what you do, um, and it's a beauty that's often used through employing metaphor. Um, so how do, you, how do you think about metaphor, and, and where do you come up with them? I, I, I tend to think in images. My poems sort of construct themselves around images. Um, I have always felt metaphor uh, or, or, or simile, which although they're different linguistic constructions, they really are very similar in what they're doing, as sort of this uh, tremendous leap over the abyss. You're saying A is like B. And to me, that is uh, really the gesture of poetry, which is an attempt to connect two different things, two, ultimately two different psyches, the writer and, and the reader. Um, so, so to me, uh, I think in these images, I, uh, they, they sort of come up uh, in, in, in me, uh, and I try to set them down and sort of follow them and see, see where they might be leading ultimately. But I don't think of images as uh, symbolic in the strict sense that they are concrete things that stand for abstractions that the poet is already aware of. I think if that's part of the process, it's doomed to failure. Uh, instead, I think they have to come up like um, archetypal images that are saturated with resonance, uh, if not meaning, and that therefore can, can sort of resonate and have different valences to them, rather than being something that stands directly for something else, which, which to me never works really well. Yeah, that was what, just last week, uh, Mark Jarman was talking about how, and in his book, uh, Dailiness, he has a whole chapter about metaphor, and he says something about how, um, 
the only time a metaphor can succeed is if it fails. There's something kind of that that suggestion in it, like it's just off enough. Like there's something ephemeral about it that you can't quite connect. And if it's too perfect and too you know one to one a relationship, it doesn't really work. Um, which is an interesting thing to think about. And and, and on display in um, a poem like Mahler in New York. Uh, do you want to read another poem? Sure, I'll I'll read uh, another poem from. Uh, from that first book of mine, which is uh, the book is called Fugue for Other Hands. Uh, and it being October now, um, I'll, read, I'll read this poem that is called October. October. This is the season in which the lambs begin to die, in which the boy in his red and blue plaid shirt gets down on his wrists and his knees to crawl into the moorland at night and spread a cross of pumice on their foreheads, in which he reads to them a hymn like a freighter burning with a cargo of ripened fruit, because in the morning he will have to kill them, because in the morning he will wake to find his father standing in the hall like a horse with a lamp in its mouth. And he will have to wade into a river with only that silence in his arms. And he will harm them. Because every year I watch him stand at the threshold of a season and begin to call them. To hold the ruined bodies of the dead with only a dim cord of flame between his lips. And to touch them. To touch them and to be with them, to touch them, and to sing with them the way a child touches everything with the hand of his murderer. And that was uh, October from uh, Fugue, uh, Fugue with Other Hands, is that the right title? Fugue for Other Hands, Fugue yeah. Fugue for Other Hands, yeah. So, um, uh, and I think I just learned because I never like look at people's bios. Um, I did not realize that you were a mathematician and astrophysicist before you became a poet. Um, so can you talk a little about what your journey was into poetry and why, how did you end up here instead of um, studying things like um, the overview effect or whatever? When I was, when I was, uh, when I was a child, I was sort of certain that, that I was going to be a mathematician and, and uh, study physics, particularly astrophysics. I was very interested in astronomy and uh, pursued those things my first two or year and a half, I would say, at, at Harvard University. Um, I, I tend not to think in terms of this sort of reductive way we have of, of sort of classifying people, right brain, left brain. I was very called to those uh, mysteries and, and the sort of rational way of sort of making sense of the universe. But uh, I'm one of those people who was sort of always pulled in the direction. I was always a reader, a voracious reader. I sort of knew that I wanted to create. I knew that I wanted to write, uh, but I didn't really have the script for that around me in the culture in which I, I grew up. Uh, so I sort of had to find my way into that. And I, somewhere along the line, as I was studying those great mysteries and mathematics and the sciences, I sort of realized that what I was mostly interested in was the way we as human beings process those mysteries, the way we speak about them. Uh, and, and language was always sort of right, right there for me. So it, it may seem, and sometimes it does seem to me when I'm talking about it, like an enormous leap from mathematics and, and physics uh, to thinking about poetry. But to me, poetry is so much about structure and about form and about finding uh, those ineffable, inevitable moments when you're able to express something in a, in a language, a given language, let's say the English language, and you feel you've connected to somehow the grand structure of things, some mystery that, 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 that has to do with structure. Uh, so there's, there's something mathematical about it. Uh, the English romantics used to think of poetry as numbers um, and you know, something quantifiable about it. So, uh, you know, I, I sort of found myself pulled gravitationally, as it were, toward poetry. And I, I couldn't, I think I said to you the other day, you know, I don't know if anyone would pick a life of poetry. It, it sort of chooses you. Um, and that's the way it seemed to me. And, and I haven't been able to stop since. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine is a mathematician. I think th I can only think of one other mathematician poet, which is Pedro Poitivan, who we published at. We had a um, tribute, of, uh, tribute to scientists on issue 48, but I can't remember any mathematicians there except for him. 
Um, I can't remember if he was in that issue or not. But um, but there's a way that that math. I don't know how far did you go along into like numbers theory and things. I, uh, my college roommate is a mathematician, and um, and he always talks about math as a different kind of poetry. Um, when he and it's in number theory and um, you know those non Euclidean spaces and all of that stuff. Um, there is a poetry to it, isn't there? Absolutely. Uh, I'd say that I wrote a book once called uh, Vincent, which is a book uh, a, a, in the voice of somebody who's done a particularly reprehensible thing. But in that book, there is this sort of this speaker's mad attempt to make rational sense of the universe and also to connect to others as though he could develop some sort of proof that love would be all about. And so uh, so to me, you know, that that was a project in which uh, and also what you were saying earlier about about metaphor. Um, he, the speaker of that book tries sort of manically and madly to connect A to B. He's constantly listing similes. This is like this. This is like this. And you realize somewhere along the line between his mathematical drive and his drive towards similes, he's really trying to find a way to prove um, the connection between between people. So uh, to me, to me, that's that's sort of one way to think about the, mm-hmm. the ways they interact. Yeah. And, and just to, to finish up on the math topic, but there's a there's a way I think that I mean, I, I took math until about uh, my junior year. Or, yeah, I guess junior year of college and, and did some you know theoretical math classes. And there was a way that a proof when you sort of figure it out. Um, you know, I think I remember one of the things uh, was to prove pi or prove uh, prove the Pythagorean theorem in a different way than the way that was the way that we were taught. It was our class assignment for like the week or the month or something. And then when it finally clicks, there's that feeling for a second. It's the same way when a poem clicks, it seems to me. Like there's mm. something, there's some alignment that comes into play where everything balances out on each side of the equation or something. Do you, do you, do you feel that when you finish a poem? Is there some kind of... Um, mathematical proof feeling to it it feels like it does feel like something inevitable has happened and it's a rare sort of feeling but when it does happen it feels wonderful but it's funny you mention that because the very last line of that long poem vincent is my beautiful proof lay in ruins <laughs> and so there's a way in which he has not been able to reach that perfect place of completion and i think there's a way in which poems can end uh, with that feeling as well which paradoxically is just as satisfying you you kind of are humbled uh into recognizing that there's that epistemological horizon you you can't know uh, and a poem can be giving voice to to that impossibility of knowing yeah yeah um so if anybody has any questions for uh joseph feel free to ask them on either facebook or youtube i'm monitoring the chat windows on both of those platforms um but so uh feel free to ask away and i will pass those questions along but let's hear another poem joseph Sure. Uh, I'll read a poem. I'm sort of going in order through through my books, uh, which I rarely have an opportunity to do. So thanks. Um, this is uh, my second book, uh, Inheritance, which came out in 2014, I think. And this is a poem uh, called The Figure. Uh, and it sort of reckons a little bit with uh, sort of those big archetypal figures in our lives and, and what we do with their absences. The Figure. You sit at a window and listen to your father crossing the dark grasses of the fields toward you. A moon soaking through his shoes as he shuffles the wind aside. The night in his hands like an empty bridle. How long have we been this way? You ask him. It must be ages, the wind answers. It must be the music of the wind turning your fingers to glass, turning the furniture of childhood to the colors of horses, turning them away. Your father is still crossing the acres, a light on his tongue, like a small coin from an empire that has always been ruined. Now the dark flocks are drifting through his shoulders with an odor of lavender, an odor of gold. Now he has turned as though to go, but only knelt down with the heavy oars of October on his forearms to begin the horrible rowing. You sit in a chair in the room. The wind lies open on your lap like the score of a life you did not measure. You rise you turn back to the room and repeat what you know. 
The earth is not a home. The night is not an empty bridal in the hands of a man crossing a field with a new moon in his old wool. We abandon the dead. We abandon them. And that was the figure um, from um, Joseph's other book, The Crossing, I think it was, you said, right? That one was uh, Inheritance. Oh, Inheritance. Okay. So um, there's there's something about your your poetry that seems very authoritative. Like there's a voice, there's sort of a confidence in the voice and, and maybe a, um, I don't know, the thing I think about it, which is a weird thing to say maybe, but it feels like you write in form when you don't. There, there's mm-hmm. a kind of, um, you know, a throwback to like a di- when, when poetry is sort of a, a different weightier mode of speech and people thought of it that way. Um, so how do you, how do you think about that voice that is a poet's voice, which is different from your own voice? Because it's, it's very distinctly different in your work, I think. Yeah, I, um, I, I do think of it as, as, uh, as weighty. I, uh, I know, I know what you mean. I think that's a wonderful way of saying that, uh, that it's sort of in form uh, while it's not. And I think that statement that you made is sort of predicated on, the, on a certain idea of what form is. For example, you know, when I'm talking to my students about rhyme and poetry, they say, well, I write poetry that doesn't rhyme. I said, no, you don't. You just maybe don't write poetry that has end rhyme. But of course it has rhyme. It has internal rhyme structures. And so I think, I think po- poetry is, it, you know, its cadence, its rhythm and its sound um, and it's deep attention to how to organize those things. So even the most seemingly conversational poem, and some of my poems, I'm reading some of my early work there, um, which is very lyrical in nature. Um, but, but even the most seemingly conversational uh, of poems, uh, it's an illusion. It's, 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 it, it, it's crafted. It's crafted in this way that's based on, uh, it's based on rhythm and it's based on lineation and based on silence. Um, but I don't know on some level, uh, it's just the way I hear it. And, and, and I don't say that to to, to sort of just be reductive. It, it's just, um, you know, the, I think that you can, you can try to change your voice and find different layers to it. Um, but ultimately, um, what I write is really what I, what I hear, um, and, and the rhythms and, and I think of poetry also as kind of a ritual. And so in ritual, there's a lot of structure. And so when I'm writing uh, and when I'm hearing a poem and feeling it sort of move through me, I do think of it as sort of the, the sort of the cadences of some 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 ritualistic activity. So it, it very much uh, uh, feels like another world, but maybe another world in in this one. And, and so what is your writing process like um, since you mentioned that like? Uh, you know, it's a, if it's a, if you're sort of creating a space for the poem, um, how do you create that space? How do you get there? And, and how often do you do it? Just like the nuts and bolts of it. Like how, how often do you sit down and try to write a poem? And how often do you find that it's coming out and that you're doing that thing that you're, you're talking about? Uh, I, every day. I, 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 I write every day. Um, you know, and I have, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I have, uh, and I have a family and I have, uh, um, and I'm a teacher but I think it's important to try to live in the work uh, and not sort of sequester it from, from the life entirely. So I'm always taking notes. That's really part of the process, um, writing them down uh, uh, and, and sort of collecting them. And then sort of somehow the notes have a way of coalescing and maybe making a poem. So sometimes I'll take hundreds of pages of notes before a poem begins. And there's a sense of urgency suddenly. The poem needs to begin. And then some of those images get sort of uh, come together uh, in a way. But um, if I'm not making a new poem, what I'm trying to do normally is sit down in front of maybe 10 or 12 poems and uh, revise them, work on them and see actually that these two poems are meant to be one. Uh, So I'm sure what I'm saying is something that a lot of uh, poets are familiar with in terms of the process. It's all one kind of organic thing. Uh, But I do think it's important. I think it was Haydn once who said you have to learn to show up every day and then the muse will learn to show up. Um, you sort of, um, I don't think it's something that you can just kind of do. You have to write also a bunch of horrible, terrible <laughs> lines and miserable poems and things that don't work and repeat yourself again and again. Um, so it's a mess really. Um, and from that hopefully emerges something like the structure I was talking about before. 
Yeah, and how do you know when it when it has emerged? Like, how, how do you know when you hit on something and it works? Like, do you doubt yourself? Like, like do you know, hey, this is done and this worked? Or is it more of like a, is, does this really work or not? Like, how, how well do you know your own work, I guess, is what I'm asking. I think, I think, sure, there's a lot of doubt. Sometimes you can create out of that space of doubt. I think what happens is the poem uh, kicks you out. Um, Louise Glick talks about this in one of her essays, and I, I think she's absolutely right. There's a point at which, sort of for better or worse, it, it kicks, it, 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 it's done, that you can't find that headspace again and sort of go back into it. And then you have to decide whether or not you want to print the poem. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think generally speaking, you have a sense that that world that was creating that poem uh, is over. Mm. Uh, and uh, who was it? Paul Valery, who once said, poems are never finished, they're only abandoned. And in a way, they feel like they abandon you, too. But, but yeah, you just sort of have a sense that it's done with you, that, that those ghosts are finished with you. <laughs> uh, well, let's hear uh, the next poem that you wanted to share. Sure. So uh, now I'll move on to a reading from, uh, from my newest collection of poems, which is called The Crossing, um, which came out in 2008. And this is just a short little poem uh, called Letter. Uh, Letter. Tonight, as you walk out into the stars or the forest or the city, look up as you must have looked before love came, before love went before ash was ash. Look at them, the city's mists, the winters, and the moon's glass you must have held once in beginning. That new moon you must have touched once in the waters saying, change me, change me, change me. All I want is to be more of what I am. And that was letter from the crossing. Um, so, so you never you didn't mention much about the astrophysics, which I've never talked to somebody who uh, was interested in astrophysics. So, so have you written any poems um, dealing with those topics? And and what's the most um, I don't know the, the most interesting question maybe that you've come across that you sort of is there something that you ponder a lot about as far as that that astrophysics realm? Yeah, I, I uh, it's funny because I was just mentioning to my wife, uh, who's sitting not far from me now, uh, today we were talking about uh, something that I think every poet is probably attracted to this idea in astrophysics, which is uh, the dark energy and the dark matter in the universe, this idea that there's an incredible percentage of, of material in our universe that is uh, not interacting with, with the other material, and, and, and we have no idea what it is. I mean, and that already is sort of a sort of poetic concept. It's an, it's an incredible um, idea. I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I've written. I'd have to think about it if I've written, as I say, apart from my book, Vincent, which sort of treats of these of these things in, in a certain way. Um, I've written. A, I haven't published it yet, but I've written a persona poem uh, in the voice of, of, of somebody navigating astrophysics. Um, but really, as I say, I think I think more. I, I like to see it as a part of the entire and the, the entire work, which is sort of thinking about these these large uh, these larger questions. But yeah, you know what I mean. I mean you, I've heard this concept of dark energy and dark uh, dark matter. It's 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 incredible. Um, uh, uh, my wife and I were watching a documentary just the other day about the sort of long term future of the universe, and and it's impossible to ponder these things without feeling incredibly humble. I think that's what poetry does. You mentioned, you asked the question whether or not I have confidence in my work or a feeling of doubt. I think the work can be confident, but the poet is incredibly humbled before the, before the work. Um, you know, you can, you know, like ego goes out the door when you're writing a poem. You cannot lie to yourself about whether or not it's working or not working. Um, T.S. Eliot has this great line in the Four Quartets. He says, the only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the wisdom of humility. And then he goes on and he says, Humility is endless. And I love that, that concept that to be really humbled before these big questions, whether you're pondering astronomy or the Sestina, um, that's when you touch the immensities, when you just sort of vanish. Yeah, there, the thing that I think about a lot with, um, you know, astronomy is that the a lot of people I talk to talk about how they write poetry so there's something that outlives them. 
Um, and but then if you go far enough out, right, the uh, the sun will turn into a, in seven billion years will turn into a red giant and consume the earth. And whatever you wrote, it will be, you know, burned up in a fiery ball of iron wow. plasma or whatever. Um, I don't know what what is it that drives you to write? Like, is there is there some kind of sense of of saving something outside yourself? Is that something a part of it that that you do that you do it for? It's it's very funny that you say that because I do think in those terms, it's so true, right? You you I think as human beings, that's what we do. We build the pyramids, we construct things. We uh, you know the the Egyptians were trying to defeat death. I mean, that's what it is to be human. And of course, we create other people. That's another way of, of keeping ourselves alive. But ultimately, of course, it's true. When you reflect on that, I mean, none of this is going to last. I mean, the books I'm holding in my hands are going to be ash um, and then be nothing. Uh, so I don't write with any... So I think there was a moment in human history when perhaps someone could write and think in terms of, of something lasting. Um, I don't have any illusions about that. I mean, first of all, my work might last not even as long as I last. Secondly, if it outlasts me, it, it'll, it'll, it'll all vanish. I think in the face of that, you have to confront real spiritual beliefs. When I do have some, uh, I, I think of poetry as, as some great work that participates in um, maybe bringing some spiritual force in the universe to a higher level of consciousness. Um, it starts to sound very sort of spiritual and perhaps uh, hermetic, but I'll just say that in my own sort of headspace, I have ways to uh, to sort of justify the, the the work. But then on a very on a much simpler level, it's simply it's an addiction. It's I have to do it. Um, you know, I feel miserable when I'm not doing it. So it's it's like uh, Carl Jung used to speak in those terms and say, well, your body needs salt. You don't ask the question why. Maybe there's some grand reason apart from, you know, evolution of your body. So maybe there's something. And, and on my better days, I can connect to it. On the other days, I say I write because if I don't write, I'm going to feel miserable. <laughs> yeah, I remember that feeling. And that once it goes away, though, just to be warned, <laughs> it's hard to get it back. Like, you re you know, it's almost like, a, you know, an operant conditioning thing where you realize that, hey, I don't need to write. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then that goes away. There were years where I, I felt the same way, where if I didn't write something, I felt, you know, I felt in the same way if I didn't get exercise, you know, I'd feel like, like mush kind of. My brain would feel like mush if I didn't. And then, um, and somehow, honestly, when I had kids, that, that disappeared. And now I don't have that feeling anymore. I really want it back. Um, <laughs> But I, I, we got to make it come back. That's what that's my my goal. My New Year's resolution a couple of months early will be to make get that feeling back. Um, so let, let's hear another poem. What do you want to do next? Sure. Uh, I'll actually read. Uh, I'll read uh, a, a poem from a new collection of mine that I'm working on, uh, which I am calling for the time being the last song of the world. And uh, this is a poem actually that uh, that you published him in Rattle uh, sixty. Uh, and it's called Him, uh, H-Y-M-N. We are like strangers in the wild places. We watch the deer swinging the intricate velvet from its antlers, never knowing we are only as immense as what we shed in the dance. The bride and bridegroom stand at the altar. Each thing learned in mercy has a river in it. It holds the cargo of a thousand crafts of fire that went down at evening. We can neither endure our misfortunes nor face the remedies needed to cure them. The fawns move through the forest and we move through the ruins of the dance. Like Job, the mourner lays his head on the cold oak of the table. His heart is a hundred calla lilies under the muck of the river, opening before evening. We think there is another shore. We stand with the new life like a mooring rope across our shoulders, never guessing that the staying is the freightage of the dance. Orpheus turned to, to see his Eurydice gone. The Furies tore him into pieces. The sun, he said, I will worship the sun. But something in his ruin cried out for evening, evening, evening. 
The wrens build at dusk. Friends, I love their moss-dressed nests twisting in the pitch of the rafters, for they have taught me that the ruins of the dance are the dance. Another great last line in that poem that was him from Rattle Number 60, I think uh, it was. Um, I love that, that the ruins of the dance are the dance. It's a great way to end a poem. And um, um, I wanted to talk to you about the other things that you do. You have a lot of, you always have sort of new projects going on. And um, the project that you have, what was the, what, how was you phrase it? It was here. Um, a, the Poem for You series is the newest one that you're doing where people read poems on request. But you also had the American poem. Like you seem to be uh, working through and experimenting with different platforms and ways of getting poetry out and finding audiences for not your own poetry necessarily, but other people's poetry too. Um, so, so how do you think, what, what has been like, what has worked and what hasn't? And, and how do you think like the future of poetry um, from a consumer perspective is? Like how do you think it's going to be working and, and what, what, where's success and, and what hasn't worked, you know? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question. I mean, so somewhere along, along the line, I, I I just sort of became very passionate about um, you know making sure that poetry as a, a, a sort of oral medium um, is 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 really always there. So we you know we have spoken word poetry, which is fantastic, but that tends to uh, maybe take sometimes uh, different forms than poetry that's written for the page. But I think poetry that's written for the page also needs to be performed, needs to be sort of given the human voice. So it's really miraculous that we can use these technologies to sort of cross these tremendous, you know, geographic gaps and 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 deliver poetry in the human voice. So I did a series for a while that I called the American Poem Series that I was making sort of videos, maybe 10, 7, 10 minutes long. Uh, the idea being that educators could use them. And it was just a recitation of a poem delivering it as a poem. Um, I, I always love this thing that Yates said at the beginning of a recording of one of his poems. He said, um, it took me a hell of a lot of trouble to get this into verse, so I'm not going to read it as though it's prose. Um, and I, I think in those terms as well. So uh, I did that series for a little while, and uh, it was just tough for me to, to keep up uh, because it was, uh, it was a lot of production work, and it was sort of just me, and I started working on a novel at that time, so it sort of fell off. So that's life. That's a real thing that sort of got in the way. But during the pandemic, I was, uh, you know, just trying to keep myself sane like everybody else. Um, I should say during the early stages of the pandemic, it's still going on. And uh, I was just, you know, reciting poems, most of them not my own. Uh, posting them to Twitter and different platforms. And then uh, I started, you know, one day I just said, you know, to, to followers, I said, you know, what do you want me to read? Uh, and I got so many responses that I thought, well, there's a community here. So I started the Poem For You series. And um, what people do is they sort of write in, they say, I'd like to, I'd like to hear this poem or that poem. And um, we've had some great poets uh, recite. We've had um, uh, uh, Jericho Brown has read for us. Uh, Robert Pinsky has read for us. Um, we've had some really just fantastic voices. Um, so yeah, people can check that out on, on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, the poem for you series. And it's, it's been, it's been nice. It's been, um, you know, sort of consoling. Uh, it's been, it's been a project that I've really enjoyed. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, um, it feels like poetry with this new technology that we have, where we can have our voice so readily available everywhere. Um, it's sort of going is a way of going back to its roots, you know, because, you know, we had it was an oral tradition for for the tens of thousands of years before we were even writing it down. And then we wrote it down sometimes. And then there was the Gutenberg Revolution and it became the way that you would consume poetry it would be by looking at books. And, and that sort of held through until uh, YouTube and video, you know, the, enough bandwidth to have video and, and now live streaming. We have these great rattle casts and things like that. Um, so how do you think about the, I mean, you mentioned it briefly that some poems work better for performance versus the page, but how do you think of that distinction? Do you think, do you, do you think of reading poems out loud while you're writing them? Is that part of it or does it, is it mostly on the page for you? And then, and then the performance is like an extra thing after the fact. I, th I think it sort of has to work in the voice. Um, there's, you know, there can come that moment when you've written a poem and then you get up one day, maybe it's even in a book of yours, and you get up to read it and think, I can't read this poem. This, this It doesn't work in, in the voice. And that could be because your voice has changed in a way. But yeah, no, the voice is, is, is always a part of, m of my compositional process. Um, 
you know, there are a lot of reasons to break a line of poetry. Um, and then I catch myself sometimes breaking a line of poetry for the wrong reasons. You know, you can, uh, um, that gets into craft stuff we, we could talk about or not, but, but there's, you know, you could break a line of poetry because you're sort of hiding from its truth or you could do it because that's the real music of it. But um, yeah, I guess a short answer to your question is, I think it's important to have the poem as an artifact on a page. It's this beautiful moment when someone can pluck it down off a bookshelf and or on a screen even and have an intimate moment with the text. But I think the human voice is is locked right there in it. And um, and it just, and it can be, can be unlocked. But different people read poetry in different ways. I don't think that my way of reading poetry is right for another person. Um, uh, you know, some people uh, have a, a very different way of navigating the poem. Uh, but to me, I don't know, I feel I'm only here for a brief while and I have to sing my song. <laughs> yeah. Um, let, let's talk about those line breaks a little bit, since you mentioned them. And, and you're one of the poets who sort of feels, it almost like you feel free to let lines be long and then short and not have a lot of consistency through them, but they feel... Um, like they're serving a purpose too. So, so how do you think about where you break lines on the page and, and, and why? I mean, I guess there would be two ways to approach the question. One way might not be helpful because it just sounds uh, sort of uh, uh, like a careless answer, but you know, one has a, an intuition for it. But, but, but technically speaking, I think there are sort of two, two big reasons that rise to the surface for me to break a line of poetry. And one, of course, is to to do this amazing thing that poetry can do, which is to introduce semantic ambiguity. So for example, I mentioned Louise Glick, so I'll, I'll give an example of hers. She has uh, two lines at the end of a poem in her wonderful book, The Wild Iris. Um, and she's speaking in this voice that is discussing sort of the origins of humanity. And she has this line, uh, we merely knew it wasn't human nature to love. And then she breaks the line, only what returns love. And so what has she done with that line break is she has allowed for both of those meanings to exist. Because once you get the revi revised meaning after the second line, the first meaning doesn't go away. It exists. So if you had written that in prose, you wouldn't have those ambiguities. So, so line breaks can do that amazing thing. They can, they can make two realities exist at the same time. Um, so I think about that a lot. Um, maybe think is not the right word. You sort of feel your way into it as you're doing your first draft, and then you kind of see what the poem is trying to do. And then, of course, also the line breaks um, orchestrate the visceral experience of the reader. So, um, you know, you're, you're making the reader breathe uh, in a certain way, and, and, and that contributes tremendously to the emotional tenor of the poem. Um, so those are a few things that I think about or feel my way into when I'm trying to trying to figure out where to break a line. Mm -hmm. And since you, um, you mentioned the, the novel too, and uh, I think you have another one in progress or about to be published or something like that, right? Um, yeah, my, my new novel, which is called The Swallows of Lunetto, uh, it, uh, I just, uh, just signed the contract with Maudlin House. It'll be out November of, of 2022. And so what is your experience like in um, writing novels? Um, how is it different than poetry? And why were you drawn to um, write novels in the way that you do? It's funny because when I was, uh, when I was first starting my career as a poet, I was in my 20s and, and, and I, people would ask me um, in, 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 in you know, a good natured kind of way and, and well-intentioned, are you going to write a novel? And I would always take a little bit of offense to this because it was this feeling of like, you know, are you going to write something that actually sell, actually sells copies? And I always thought that that's maybe where there was coming from. But but maybe it was also coming from a place of people relating to stories. And I never thought I was going to. Uh, but I found myself writing this, uh, my first novel, which is called The Dark Heart of Every Wild Thing. I found myself just writing it. Um, I, I, I sat down at my writing desk one day and sort of found my, this story coming out. And um, and so, you know, I, I enjoy writing fiction. It presents different aesthetic problems. And one of the things that is interesting to me as a poet is the question, where are the silences? I guess different prose writers think different things about their own prose. But I, for me, I think, where are the silences in prose? Because we were just talking about line breaks in poetry. But it becomes a question, where are those silences in, in prose? Well, you could say something easy, like they're between paragraphs or between people and dialogue. But practically, it gets very interesting because it's just sort of a wall of text. And to someone like myself, who's, I don't know, I'm maybe tuned, tuned a little bit differently where I like those silences and those pauses, 
I've had to think about where those exist in my prose. And that's just been an interesting question, one, one interesting question. But yeah, I, I think it's more, um, I still think of myself as a poet who sometimes finds himself with stories that he has to tell. And did that first, uh, did that novel start as a, um, as a poem? Like when you said it came out, were you sitting down? Like what were you doing when you sat down and that came out? Did it? I sat down and I wrote a paragraph um, and there were no line breaks in it. And uh, that paragraph exists now in the middle of that novel. I did not start it at the, at the, at the, at the beginning. No, it was a scene that I saw. And then, and then what happened was I had these characters that emerged. And um, that's normally the way I, in the two novels that I've written, um, it comes because I have these sort of characters and I let them talk to each other and, uh, and just sort of see where the story goes from there. Um, the new novel that, I'm, uh, th th that will be out next year is a novel that uh, takes place at the end of the Second World War in Italy. And it's about two people who sort of fall in love. They have very complicated past. They're sort of escaping the, the legacy of fascism in the Second World War. And there was just a lot there in those characters. And I just sort of let them talk for a while and, and see where the story is. And then you really have to sort of do you know, you have to tear your hair out for about a, you know, for a year or more to even get something on, on that looks looks like the shape of it, but it's worth it. And it, was it true that, um, you know, it was much easier to sell those novels? Like, are the, are the, the sales figures way up compared to poetry? Uh, I don't know that they're way up. Um, the first novel did well, um, but it's hard to find a good home for a literary fiction. Um, I think poetry has a wonderful kind of, um, home, you know, people who love your poetry, who publish your poetry, and, and it'll get out there because there's no illusion of anybody sort of making money. I always say we're free of the marketplace, and that's a good thing. But as soon as you start talking about stories, you start talking about things that has a, it has a different level of consumption, different levels of expectation. So, um, you know, if you're somebody like myself, I mean, I, I like to write novels that I'm interested in writing novels that... Uh, that tell a very compelling story, but that also are profoundly interested in the language. Um, so, you know, I don't know if it's easy to, to, to always find an audience, but I, I think you just work and you write the books that you really, really have to write and, and they'll, they'll find the, the people who are, who are meant to, to read them. I don't, I don't worry too much about that. It, uh, it works out. Uh, well, uh, I think we have two poems left you wanted to share. Do you want to do the second to last one, the moon? Uh, yes, sure. I will uh, bring that up. This one I have to bring up on my little device here. Uh, the moon. And this came from uh, from someone saying what I'm sure a lot of poets have heard, which is, you know, when are you going to stop writing about the moon? So I wrote this this poem. The moon. I, too, am tired of it. And yet, like an old love, it comes to us, illuminating the bare walls of our houses catching its hems on our thresholds, carrying its little cup of blossoms. We are done with it. Aren't we done with it? We have told ourselves only grace can change us. We have told ourselves the craft is not the magic. We have told ourselves the myths are in our hands. And yet Isa wrote to us and ever let us walk out to the summer grass and be there. Let us look up through the deepest leaves and open. Let us wait then while the ancient things are woken. Because haven't we always been lonely? Haven't we looked up into the wild skies and asked too to be luminous and ruined and risen like this cold stone in the darkness and changed in it as radiantly as we can. And that was the moon, another newer poem. Um, uh, what has your experience been like teaching? We haven't talked about that at all yet. Like what, uh, how does, um, how do your workshops go? And, and is there a certain advice that you find? Do you, are you teaching creative writing? First of all, it's something I'm not, I'm not sure about either, but if, if so, is there a certain kind of advice that you keep seeing, you know, giving your students or something that you like a lesson that you, you know, they appreciate in particular, what do you say? I don't know. I do. I do teach creative writing. I teach uh, poetry and I teach fiction, although uh, often, you know, I, it's, I teach workshops mostly uh, these days, uh, you know, to my to my sort of private students in, independently, um, which is wonderful. 
but uh, I've been teaching mostly seminars at, at Columbia University and at, at my other institution. Um, so I don't know. I mean, things that, that, that come out so specific, it's because it's so much based on the particular student that you're working on uh, and working with. It, it, one of the things that's just so true, I mean, you could talk endlessly about craft, but I think that, that that's something that you can kind of just learn off the page. is It's just so important to give like a really young person just encouragement. Um, you know, it, it seems like such an easy thing to say, but to really be able to, to say, I can hear you and I can hear your voice. Um, and also the other thing that has come up lately, especially as we talk about the world in which, you know, I'll have um, I'll have students who are 19 years old and say, I haven't published anything yet. And, and one of the things that I do try to remind my students is to give yourself that solitary apprenticeship, you know, to you, you not maybe necessarily have to rush. Because these days, I mean, to publish something, it depends where you want to publish it, but you, you can publish something. I mean, right? I mean, there's so many different outlets and so many different things online, but but maybe to 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 not rush and to to sort of slow it down a bit and to to find your voice and to find your cadences and to find your images and yeah, it's good to share things and to get feedback, but that's one thing that outside of craft and outside of all the technical stuff that I talk with uh, my students about. And, and, and I think that they appreciate that just to say like, you know, um, catch your breath and then share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I, um, I was teaching my son how to play tennis uh, for the first time this summer. And, you know, I it got to the point, I'm, I'm not a good teacher. And it got to the <laughs> point where I like looked up YouTube videos. How do you teach kids to play tennis? And I found this one YouTube video where it was a tennis instructor at some academy or whatever. And he said that the trick to teaching kids, um, of course, you know, he's he's seven and, and kids in college are in college. But still, the, the trick to teaching anybody anything is to praise what works and to keep mm. them interested and in, in happy about doing it. And, other, and if you say like, hey, don't, you know, don't swing this way, you have to swing this way. And it's a corrective thing then um, it, it ruins the joy of it, and then that ruins the student. And, and the whole point is to, to be encouraging and pushing forward the things that they're doing right. If they hit the ball one out of ten times, to say, oh, yeah, you hit it that time, you know, and keep it, keep it positive, which I don't know. I mean, I just don't think in terms of teaching. So um, it seems like that's really good advice to, to focus on that kind of thing. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, – your use of um, a persona, because Mahler, we already talked about, is in persona. The poem in the current issue of Rattle, um, Joe Arity, is about a um, uh, somebody who was um, um, convicted in a murder and executed um, wrongly in 1930 something or other, and um, and and it feels like um, I don't know. It's almost like a brave step or like a, a bold step to step into somebody else's voice and actually like try to see through their eyes. Um, do you, do you worry about doing that and, and how, how much like research goes into a poem so that you feel confident that you can do that in like an authentic way? Um, how do you approach the persona poem? I mean, firstly, I, I get tired of myself. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's great to take a break. It's great to take a breather and to sort of step into somebody else's, um, somebody else's skin. You know, there's, you're never, you're not, you're not actually doing it, right? You're not actually becoming that other person. You're not actually so. There's a presumption to it. Um, you know, you can you can write a persona poem that's in a made-up character, and then you sort of just have are free to not be yourself, or or maybe free to be yourself. Um, or you can you can write a poem that's in the voice of, of somebody who is uh, who is an actual sort of person. There are then conversations to be had about you know what it means to appropriate that voice. Um, I, I think that uh, we. We should worry about that, but I think the poem should be the space in which you worry those questions into being, because literature exists to do the impossible, which is to you know uh, try to cross the infinite gap between subjectivities. So you know you're 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 trying to do that all the time. So you know is it impossible to become somebody else? Yes. Therefore, you should do it. Therefore, you should try to do it and fail. And so uh, I love doing that. I love um, picking up these voices, whether it's my book, Vincent, or that Joe Arity character, I found an incredibly compelling um, character. And, and a few of my friends uh, read that poem and, 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 and one had a real strong reaction against it. And one of my closest friends um, just saying, you know, because it's taking on the, 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 the headspace of somebody who, is, who, who has difficulties or, or, or challenges cognitively. Um, I, I find I just find them really, really uh, interesting and difficult and, and impossible to do. And I like the challenge 
you know, and, and to sort of disappear. Um, you really do feel like you're disappearing when you're writing a poem. And so the persona poem really sort of allows that to, uh, uh, to happen. Not something I like to do all the time because I do, you know, I like to, to, to sort of speak in whatever I think of as, as my own voice. But yeah, I, I, I enjoy them because they're impossible. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, they're very difficult poems to do. We don't get to publish a lot. We had a persona poems issue. Um, 63 did that. But it's not a, it's not a thing that people tackle very often. Um, how do you like, like, how are you drawn? Like, what is your reading? Do you read a lot of biographies? Like, how did you come across just in, in particular, the Joe Arity character? Like, how did you, it's someone I'd never heard of. There's a Wikipedia page for it, but I haven't seen anything in depth about it. Where did you find uh, that, that person? I found that character. I have a good friend of mine who uh, he and I are, are sort of fascinated with, uh, with characters who are, you know, uh, you know, the, the crimes and, 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 injustices that happen and people are executed sort of wrongly. I mean, it's just sort of a, a strange, um, you know, hobby that my, my good friend and I have. So we were trading, you know, uh, research about that. And, and then I had f- happened upon this character, this person, Joe Arity, who was, um, you know, probably all evidence points to the fact that he was wrongfully accused and sort of forced to make, make a confession um, uh, for, for this crime. And that's just something also that speaks to me on a, on a, on a sort of um, uh, just, just individual level, you know, because I think that um, when you start talking about people who are, you know, falsely accused of things, you mean, you're also talking about what the fundamental human condition, which is being misunderstood, you know. And so I love these voices, these, these voices of, of, of people speaking from the perspective of, of saying, you know, this is not who I am. This is who you think I am. But this is not who I mean, who can't relate to that? It's just that these persona poems blow it up on a level where you perhaps really magnify that aspect of, of human existence. Um, so it takes these problems. I like to think that these persona poems that I'm working on take these issues that all of us have when we're wandering through the grocery store on a Wednesday evening, but they they magnify certain things sort of tremendously. They find those those lives in which those questions have been tremendously magnified. And I think if we go into those lives, the same reason we like to watch films and disappear into different characters, poetry can really explore those questions. And, and I think that's fascinating. And I think it's something we should keep doing. Yeah, well, we're just about out of time, Joseph. So do you want to finish out with uh, your, the last poem that you have here? Sure. I'll finish with uh, a poem that, that uh, is called Odysseus, which is maybe a good poem to finish with in the sense that it is about Uh, that great journey that we all take and ultimately to arrive where we started. Odysseus. Think of the moment before the moment, before recognition, before the nurse saw the boar's scar coursing down his thigh, where the world had first entered him in the forests of childhood, before Penelope, before his battle for her heart. Think of his moment alone on the shore, his sailors running up to the village where girls stood wringing spices from their hair. Think of the gods saying to him, you do not have to praise ruin anymore. You do not have to praise what is lost. How you imagine him is how you enter things. He is kneeling or he is weeping or he is turning toward the sea again, thinking of the great deeds of the hopeless. Think of him lifting the sands and touching them to his tongue to see if it is real, if it is home, if it is time. Think of the moment before he knew he had stepped out of the myths and into his life. Whether that means to you that he would sing or mourn or be lessened, and his patience when he rose up again and took himself the long way toward his kingdom, not knowing if it had all changed or if love had lasted or if anything can last. Think of him as though he were your life, as though you had sat waiting at a loom for long, dark years, weaving and unweaving what you are. Think of your life returning to you with eyes that had seen death. And whether he would look away if you saw him 
pausing a moment among the gardens and the horses, listening to the song of each thing, the common things he had forgotten. Think of him hearing your voice again, hiding his face in his hands as he listened, hearing a music of losses and joys, pestilence and bounty, a beauty that had prepared a place for him. And whether you would have him be changed by that or return to what he was or become what he had come this way to become. And Joseph Fazana, thanks so much for being a guest today. It's been a pleasure talking to you and hearing just these beautiful poems, which really come across that way. And, and that's what people are saying in the comments. They just love your use of line and language and the music of it. Um, yeah, thanks for being a guest and, and sharing an hour with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. It's really great. Yeah, have a good night. Too. So it was Joseph Fasano. And uh, once again, his newest, uh, his novel is The Dark Heart of Every Wild Thing from Platypus Press in 2020. Um, he's also the author of The Crossing and um, several other books, Fugue for Other Hands, etc. So check him out there. You can also check out what he was talking about, that, um, that series of poems. On Twitter, it's Poem for You. You can pretty much just type in Poem for You anywhere. So type in Poem for You on Twitter, Facebook, or uh, Instagram, and you'll find his uh, poetry series of well-known poets and people like that uh, sharing poems by request, which is always a lot of fun, very interesting. Um, and you can find more of Joseph Fasano's work, all of his books and everything, at uh, josephfasano.net. That's Fasano, F-A-S-A-N-O.net. So check him out there. And um, just wonderful poetry and a wonderful poet. So thanks so much for, uh, for being a guest, Joseph. And now we're going to move on to our, um, our uh, open lines. And um, the, how it works is right here here so email your poem right now if you haven't yet to open mic that's open mic at rattle.com and then choose one or the other not both because then i'll call you twice and that's confusing so just uh pick right, uh, skype for video and uh, phone for uh, just audio if you can only do that that's fine uh the skype id is rattle poetry just type that into the search bar and say hello and i will call you back when it's your turn that's how you sign up um, anybody who requests to read i will call you back within the hour over the phone, the number is 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Just call a few times or let it ring a few times and hang up. And then it'll show up on my screen and I will call you back when it's your turn. That is how we do the open lines here. And one important reminder, um, this is going to be, our connection is going to be through the phone or through Skype. And there's a delay of about 20 seconds or so. So make sure that you sh mute um, the broadcast wherever you're listening to it right now when the phone rings and I call you up because otherwise there's two Tims and you can't hear who you're talking to. It's very confusing with that delay. It's just like the old time radio shows. So make sure that you uh, mute your, your radio uh, before you talk to me and, um, and also have your poem in front of you because you won't be able to read it off the screen because we're about 20 seconds apart. Anyway, we're going to take a brief break. I'm going to put, um, find everything, uh, get everything set up. I'm going to stretch a little bit and I will be right back in maybe 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, see you in a minute.
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Let me get this done before we do this. I'm still having this problem where um, if I use any natural light during the show, it, um, let's see, it, uh, the light changes. It's dark now. When the show started, it was at uh, this time of year. We start when the show is, um, there we go. That's a little better. We start in the daytime. And then by the time we're done with our guests, the show's over or the, the day is over and it's pitched dark outside so i got these windows in front of me and um they uh (laughs) they're completely dark right now so um let's go to the prompt for this week just to share neither megan or i came up with poems uh for you this week but the prompt was this so maybe you did better than us let's see so the prompt was right here it was um let me get this down all right. The prompt was to write a poem in the second person. Uh, and, and Megan referenced one of the most famous poems written in the second person is uh, Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. So that's a sample of what you might want to do. Um, and um, let's see what you have on the open lines. Oh, that's still bad. <laughs> let me try to fix this again. Um, let's see. Let me a little more. There. See, it's all washed out or not. Maybe we'll, I don't know. I really got to get lights. But the problem with lights is that I have the the document cam set up. And so I can't have shadows on the document cam either. Um, anyway, whatever. I look weird. That's okay. Nothing unusual about that. So um, let me call up first. Um, we'll do a, a veteran first. We'll call up uh, Brent Stoffer first. And then we'll go to some first-time callers. We have a 238 number. No, 239. We have a 312 and we have a 330, so we have three first-time callers. We have um, Gigi Capone wants to read a poem. Uh, it's, his, it's Ted Guevara's sister. He, she wants to read a poem, so we'll do that. Um, 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 Shenhu, Shenhu Lee would like to share a poem as well. And another first-time caller. We have Julian Matthews, uh, Dick Westheimer, um, Angela Gartner, uh, Carla Schwartz. we got a whole host of good people. I'm glad that you covered for us because we're, we're just going through a really busy phase right now. And haven't had a chance to write our own poems, and um, which it feels, it does feel a little sad not sharing a poem. Let me still try to fix this lighting. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so let us call up, as I mentioned, let's call up Brent Stoffer first, and see. Brent hasn't been on in a little while. We'll see what Brent has for us this week. Hmm, it's not connecting. Let's see. We'll try again with Brent in a little bit. Let's do instead. Um, I'll call up on Patrice Wilson. And then we'll try Brent again later. Hey, Patrice, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm, nice sure. you doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing great. It's great to see you. Uh, how have you been? You haven't been on in a little while. Uh, I've been okay. Um, I just have been working on some other things that took a lot of time, and I wasn't able to to, to write in um, for the last couple of weeks or so. So, no, yeah, I'm fine. I'm okay. That's great. So what did you want to share with us tonight? Well, I sent uh, the poem out to smokers, the you poem. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got it, yep. Mm-hmm. It's so rare that I ever write in you when I don't mean myself. Uh, and <laughs> this is one where I wrote in you and I didn't mean myself. So uh, um, I visited and I have seen many people who smoke and um, and they... And I observed, when I used to work downtown Honolulu, they uh, uh, do all kinds of strategies in order to get a cigarette, in mm-hmm. order to light it. So I wrote this for them, and I am very much in sympathy with their plight, but um, also that they need to really regroup and come out of that. So I should read it, huh? Yeah, go ahead. I have it up on screen for everybody at home. Oh, to smokers, you huddle up 
against concrete corners for a light. Learn how wings blow as tenacious gray smoke flies down low with traffic and weather. Clouds above won't do for you, clouds below, invented like artists composing final opuses of mortality. You know how that one goes, how breezes take and take inhale thus, the knowledge of beginnings and endings, lips spotted with foreign substance, smoke tra strangely commingling with clothes and hair, all being in with hovering demons, as if you don't feel the chains of impulses clogging lungs, nerving veins with painted blood, concurrent with a sluggish gait toward that small red glow at the tip of each white stick, so white, pure as death, possessing a similar promise, assurance of repeated sameness, ritual of marking time and space, your fatalistic challenge to infinity, till it might catch you like fire, knocking at your final door where you beg for a way to quit, to quit, to quit. When and if you do, how a new light shines, how the earth rejoices, how there is more time for the universe to breathe. Yeah, excellent poem, and thanks so much for sharing that, Patrice. That was Patrice Wilson with Ode to Smokers. Uh, great to see you on the show, and, and that was a really wonderful poem. Important message. Thanks for sharing that, Patrice. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for letting me. Yep, good night. Mm -hmm. And it's Patrice Wilson with Ode to Smokers. And now let's try some of these first-time caller numbers. We have um, an 805 now added into the mix, too. So we have a lot of uh, first-time over-the-phone callers, which is a lot of fun. It's always sort of like a who is under the magical mystery door. Let's try 312. That was the first person to try. And we'll see who it is. Hello. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle, and you are live on the air. Who am I talking to? Um, this is Gigi Capone. I am Ted Guevara's sister. Ah, great. I'm so glad you could call in. So let me find uh, the poem uh, that Ted wanted to share, the second person prompt poem. Is that the one, Aspen Mattis? Yes, Aspen Mattis. Okay, great. And, so uh, I'm not on the video. What's mm -hmm. that? I'm not on the video. <laughs> can't quite figure out how to um, be on Skype or video, so I'll, I'll just be reading it here from my computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I just, I called you up on the regular phone, so there's no video unless I do over Skype. I, I didn't realize this was the same, you know, the same person at the phone number, but uh, but let's do this. Got uh, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, is there anything, uh, as Ted says, uh, this poem is published in uh, Susan Re Valley Review already. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else that Ted wanted to say about it? Um, actually, here it is. I have uh, this. Yeah. Do you want me to read this for you, or do you want to read the paragraph you sent? Uh, it's it's up to you. I could read it. Yeah. Um, why don't you Why don't you go ahead and read that, and I'll put it. Up. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so the name of the poem is Aspen Mattis. Uh, he says that Aspen Mattis is my insight one evening abroad while I was Facebooking with Aspen uh, in the U.S. She, of course, is the author of the memoir girl in the woods about the abusive ordeal she went through in her first night in college and the hike she took on California's Pacific coast trail to alleviate the trauma. I told Ms. Aspen, I would write her a poem from all that I had harnessed in our conversation by 4 AM that night. I had sent her the following poem. Aspen Mattis throw that cane away let it bounce and belittle itself among the down rocks. And please don't look back to cradle it like Moses' staff. It's blackness unworthy of glisten, not a standout among preset violets. Yes, your onward sway can cut through the fresh swirls, your knees shaking of good faith, 
your youth needs not rewind the loud clocks you may have placed on the high shelves. You look up and see only incomplete circle on each one. If they provide wholesome ticks, you would wish they're only clearest. The flimsiest of water over the next bend of pine trees. Resolved, they are already lunged through, smashed by your seemingly frail boots. This is what I know of you. The stars lent faint on my sight as I try to sort the needles and the cones. I look up and all the luster comes from your face. My heaves of air are not from strides the merciless back wall may have muraled in my mind. Clusters of violet stay motionless. Blackened canes are just that. We breathe to see and hunger to feel what is deeper in the soil than us. Blind me. I just see a sprig of green from that granite. A growth upward webbing cracks for the air of you. Yeah, great images in that poem. Uh, thanks so much for reading it, Gigi. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, so that was uh, Ted Guevara's sister, Gigi. Um, um, where'd it go? Um, reading Ted Guevara's poem, Aspen Mattis. Thanks so much for sharing that. And um, really nice that you could do that and read it for us. Um, let me go to, um, actually, let me do another, um, another first time caller. This is a three, three, zero number. Let's see if we can get them on the line. Hello, this Hello? is yeah, this is Tim with Rattle and you are live on the air. I do hear myself in the background, so mute your stream wherever you're watching this and then just talk over the phone. Okay. Okay, sounds good now. And who am I talking to? Um, my name is Shan Huli. I'm reading the poem first time. So I'm very excited and uh, thank you so much for including me. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad to uh, to have you on here. Let me try to find the poem. You emailed it to us, right? Let's see. Mm. Let's see. Was it here? No. Um, what was your name again? How how do you spell that so I can look it up? Shan Hu Li. Let me see. Hmm. Well, I'm not seeing it here. Um, is it, did you email it to me at uh, at open mic at rattle dot com? Um, yes, uh, it is submitted for the poet response. Ah, okay. It is. Maybe it was. Maybe it would be over there. Let me go try to find out. It's just nice to be able to read along as we as we um hear the poem. It is a cadaver note. Ah, okay. I hear it. Oh, wait, no, that's general poems. Hmm. Sean. It is the same general submission as well. Okay. Uh, let me. Um... That's so weird because I thought I saw it here and now I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's over here. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, everybody at home. Um, that is weird. No problem. I swear I saw this poem. Let me try. No, I didn't accidentally delete it. Hmm. Well, I think you're just going to have to read it and we'll have to listen, okay? I'm sorry about that. But what is the poem about? Um, this is about uh, the very famous trial for Robert Durst. Mm -hmm. um, so he killed his uh, wife 29 or 39 years ago. And uh, since then, he was not uh, uh, caught at all. And uh, um, after he killed his uh, best friend, he finally, he was, uh, you know, 
sentenced to life. Yeah, so this is, oh, Robert Durst. Yeah, so this is uh, from the New York Times. Uh, Robert Durst sentenced to life in prison. Um, and so the, the poem is Cadaver Note. I found it. <laughs> I found it in the actual submission. So I don't know. I swear it was in uh, my email, but now it's just missing. But I have it here, Cadaver Note. So go ahead whenever you are, are ready to read it, and I have it up on screen now. So should I just like, go read it? Yeah, go ahead and read it, yeah. Okay. So, Robert Durst confessed he's a serial killer. He felt he had to. For 40 years, he evaded the laws and escaped from justice. Cadaver. He wrote along with Susan's address, sent an anonymous letter to the police. So he confessed he is a serial killer. That is the letter only the killer could have written. He declared in the Jinx documentary. What a smart ass. He believed he could evade the laws. But he could not tell the difference in handwriting of the cadaver note and his own letter to Susan. Robert Durst is a passionate serial killer. Bravely, misspelled in both letters, denied he killed his best friend. He thought he could avoid the loss again. Born into rich, poor little mama's boy, killed his wife, chopped his neighbor's body. What the hell did I do? Kill them all, of course. So how did he avoid the laws all these years? Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Thank uh, you. Yeah, that was Sean Hu Lee with a cadaver note. Thanks, Sean Hu. Thank you so much. Yep, have a good night. Have a good evening. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, look up about that Robert Durst case because it's, it's, it's one of those things that we had a lot of submissions about it, and I know nothing about it. And and I was even talking to someone else yesterday, and they brought up this. I had no idea. Like, they, they, someone said, like, hey, did you hear Robert Durst has COVID? And I thought um, um, Fred Durst of Limp Biscuit was the only thing that I that came to mind when I heard the name Durst. So um, I'll have to... Uh, uh, find out more about this this Robert Durst case because it's definitely a, a hole in my knowledge base. I have no idea what this is. Uh, Robert Durst confessed he's a serial killer. Um, somehow that news just went way past my head. Uh, but thanks so much for sharing that and bringing this to our, our, my attention, Shan. Who it was an excellent poem. Now let's go on to a um, another. And actually, before I forget, let me add um, Shan, who's a contact, so we know who it is next time. There we go. And um, let's go to another um, another caller. Let's go to um, let's go to uh, Richard Westheimer. I know I'm going to surprise him because I didn't <laughs> hey, Jim. hey, Richard, how you doing tonight? Your lighting looks wonderful. It looks like some professional came and gave you a nice little makeup job. Yeah, well, I don't know. It's just, it's really frustrating, actually, because I, um, I don't know. I, I've tried, I play with the lighting so much, and I, I it, it's just frustrating. But anyway, because yeah. <laughs> um, I could, I, 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 could, I have gets... lights that I could put it, but then there's just shadows all over the, the poems, and I can't fix that problem. So I need to have it kind of dark for the mm. document cam on most episodes. Um I don't know. Maybe the yeah, only I, solution is to do it during the day. <laughs> or I, I get a lot of lighting from my second screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I have which, two. It's just I have a sensitive, fancy camera, and it wants to be very works. detailed in how it That'll goes. That'll teach you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what, what did you want to share today, Robert? Um, well, if I have time for one, I'll do my Poets Respond poem. A teacher in Texas is told she must present opposing perspectives on the Holocaust and follows orders. Yeah, this was an interesting story. Um, so do you want to explain a little bit for people who haven't heard about um, what this was? Um, so the there was a senior school administrator in, I think it was South Lake, East Lake, West Lake, one of the lakes in Texas, who was explaining to 
some very concerned teachers how they could comply with the new state law that sort of um, basically, uh, I, I don't know, bans is the right word, but, but circumscribes teaching. And it was originally aimed at what they called critical race theory. Um, but they had to make the law more general. And so she was explaining to teachers how to balance their instruction so they wouldn't um, go afoul of the law and said, for example, like if you're teaching about the Holocaust, you just have to teach about the opposing perspectives. <laughs> and basically one of the teachers who was recording this said, what, WTF? Yeah. You know, what? What are opposing perspectives? And so I re sort of responded to that question. What are, what are the opposites mm -hmm. of teaching the Holocaust that a teacher might do and still follow orders? Yeah, well, let's hear it. Go ahead whenever you're ready. I'll put it up. Sure. A teacher in Texas is told she must present opposing perspectives on the Holocaust and follows orders. A mother slices an apple for her fussy daughter, serves it on a special plate. A starving girl finds a shriveled apple core, shares it with her little brother. A woman in an Amtrak car travels to see her elderly parents. A woman on an Auschwitz-bound boxcar cradles her father's bloodied head. A boy at summer camp tucked snug in his top bunk dreams of stars that boy's great great uncle lives with rats and a hundred men in a bergen belsen barracks young friends skinny dip at a bend in the river jews of budapest are driven like cattle to the banks of the danube stripped of their shoes and shot before being dumped in a teen playing hide and seek finds the perfect hiding spot behind a bookcase in an attic, gets bored and emerges in less than an hour. A teen, diary in hand, hides with seven other people in an attic behind a bookcase for 18,264 hours before being dragged out by Gestapo and sent to her death. Students calculate how long it would take to count to six million. Answer, 70 days without sleeping. A teacher tells those students six million Jews were murdered by Nazis. A teacher in Nazi Germany is executed for sheltering Jews. A teacher in Texas is fired for teaching about the teacher who is executed for sheltering Jews. Yeah, thanks so much. A great poem, as always, Dick, but uh, but that's a really good one. Um, oh, thanks. A teacher in Texas is told she must present opposing perspectives on the Holocaust and follows orders. Some lines just really jump out of that poem. Thanks for sharing it, Dick. Always a yeah. pleasure. Uh, thanks, Tim. Appreciate you. Yep. Bye. So again, that was Richard Westheimer um, with a teacher in Texas. And uh, next up, let's try another first-time caller. And... Um, we will call up uh, this 514 number. We'll see who that is. 514. Look on the open mic list to see who it might be. Hello? Hey, this is Tim with Rattle, and you are live on the air. Who am I talking to? Hi, this is Nadima. Hi. Yeah. Thanks so much for uh, for calling in and sharing this poem with us. So, what did what is this? It's formula. Is there anything you want to say about this poem before you read it? Um, not really. I think. Um, are you going to put it up on the screen just because I have some lag? Yeah, you're going to have to read your own copy. So the the lag is um, you know, you have to read your own version of it. Otherwise, you won't be at the same place as the poem as you read it. So. Okay, we'll be good. We'll be good. I got okay. it. Okay. Um, it, this poem is about a lot of things, like my state of mind, just thinking about uh, morality and um, something kind of imagistic as well. 
Is that a good description? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's hear it. Okay. Um, formula. One. The ether cries, rain percusses, oscillating and undulating off retaining walls. The city accepts their tears, a municipality of leers. I waited underneath the pillowy, billowy, weeping willow tree with a cat, a marble, and a penny, hoping one day each roof, each pretending window would be different, less scary. Tears fall like stars, like rain from my eyes, lashes beating in synchronous time to pithy hermetically sealed rhymes, pouring in gushing iridescent persistent thick lines, street lamp backlit shimmering across globular ephemeral wet skies, entering a collapse underneath, overwrought with sentience, disrupted, rendering the formula. Did you solve the sentiment? Did you understand the process? Imagine not even caring if you hurt someone. Too many people are without conscience. Three, fountains returning, turning over ersatz machines, waving underneath the waters, recording each cycle of economy, that sound in the mall, dissociated echoes, and part-time beliefs. Excellent. Love the, the rhythms and music of that poem. Thanks so much for sharing it. And that was a formula. Thanks. Thank you. And where are you calling from? I forgot to ask. I'm in Montreal. Ah, great. Well, I'm so glad you could join us, and, and hopefully uh, you can do it again soon. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank great. you. Great. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Yeah, so that was um, um, Niliema Karkanis with a formula. And let, let's, put a, let's put her in the phone book as well so we know who is next time. There we go. And uh, let's swing back to see if we can get uh, Brent Stoffer on the line. Where was Brent? Here we go. Let's try Brent again. Hmm, so it's still not connecting for Brent, unfortunately. Um, maybe we'll try one last time later, and then I'll just read the poem if not. Um, let's go instead to uh, Julian Matthews. Hey, Julian. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm Okay. So uh, what did you have that you wanted to share? Uh, your prompt poem about uh, second person. Mm -hmm. So this is called Punctuation. Okay, yeah, go ahead whenever you're ready, unless there's one, something else you want to say about it. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, okay, just jump right in then. Punctuation. It's quite obvious you consider yourself a question mark. You like the mystery of it. You want to be an enigma so that others will be curious about you, even romantically curious, maybe. The question marks sit on your head like seahorses, their eyes in mock terror, silent and drifting with a soft tide. Perhaps one question mark was about your near suicide, another the depression that led to it, another was the search for your identity, another your dilemma with your gender, another your tentative sexual awakening, Another, your parental purgatory that drifted between hell and heaven. You feel in between sometimes, like the pause in a comma of this sentence of your life. Or perhaps the forgotten, less often used, increasingly redundant semicolon. That longer pause that separates two equally worthy thoughts. It irks you that others still can't see there is more to you. No one has really peered close enough right into your soul to uncover the beauty of your exclamation marks. Perhaps you haven't felt them yourself for some time. Perhaps you're tired of being labeled with air quotation marks that suggest you are someone you are not. So you stand up at the microphone, breathe in and stretch tall and straight and hoping others will exclaim and see the point 
of you. Or perhaps you are hyperventilating because you're trying to reinvent by hyphenating. Journalist, freelancer, photographer, editor, trainer, speaker, columnist, artist, poet, drama queen. Perhaps your inner longings are for the pregnant pause of a period. Perhaps the search, perhaps the search for you, who you are, would end finally with a full stop. Perhaps all you ever wanted was to be a good lover or spouse, maybe even a great mother or father. Perhaps some nights you would no longer feel that engulfing emptiness that comes with the unfinished poem, grappling with stanzas that have lost their rhythm, the rhymes that seem so forced, the climax of a fake sonnet, the words that do not come. And perhaps the next time you will no longer take the long drive back home alone, feeling like the last dot in an endless trailing ellipsis. And all this needy punctuation will finally end in the warm embrace of your own true self. That was wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing that, Julian. There's a way that that felt like uh, self-therapy hearing you read it. It felt good. I liked it. Um, that was punch Thank situation. You. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Tim. Yep, have a good day. It's uh, Julian Matthews. And um, let's see. So Brent says, Arg. I don't know what the problem is. Let me try Brent again. Did it work this time? Hmm. So Brent, maybe you try calling me. Because it's still not a here. I see ya. It's still, it's just not connecting. Um... We'll see if you can call me. We'll give you a second for that as the audio catches up. Um, let's see. So we still have, um, let's see, we have an 805 still. And we have um, Angela Gartner still here. And um, Carla Schwartz. So, um, and then Judith Barnstein. Maybe maybe Judith Barnstein is at the, um, is at the number. Well, let's call up um let's call up this uh this number. And this number was uh 805. Let's call up the 805. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle and you are live on the air, but I hear myself in the background, so hit mute. Yeah, no problem at all. I have to find the poem. <laughs> okay, so who am I talking to, first of all? Oh, it's Judith, the one that always does to poets respond. Oh, excellent. I'm so glad you could call in and share something. So what do you have that you wanted to share with us tonight? Well, <clears throat> hold on a minute. Okay. A poem called Letter to George the Night Before, and I picked this one because you were discussing persona poems. I think this might be the only persona poem I ever wrote. And it's about Amelia Earhart, who actually did write a letter to her husband-to-be, George Putnam, the night before, saying what she did and didn't want from their marriage. Oh, wow. So I tried to imagine in the poem what she might be saying to him. Well, that's very interesting. I, I didn't know. I had no idea about that. The letter to George. Yeah, let's hear it. Go ahead whenever you're ready. <clears throat> letter to George the night before. It's the bite of marriage that I fear, markings left by teeth, a dog collar round my neck that says I have an owner. George, till now you've called me by my name, Amelia Earhart. Let that not change once we are wed. Our union's not of names, nor written on a parchment scroll, nor sanctified by clergy, but by our love. Just as in passion's moment we forget ourselves, mingling sounds and smells, then reluctantly pull apart, taking back once more those places that were briefly bound. Just so in marriage, let us treasure times together, but also times apart. On flight days, when we've parted, I'll adjust my goggles at LaGuardia Field, reliving that delicious fear that leaves my armpits wet and then the rush of rising upward through the air. I may stay aloft past dark, then land for dinner. The clink of silver, the taking of food and wine unites us. The flight of words across the table, 
feeds our spirits as the meat our bones. So let us drink a toast to marriage, regretting nothing we've left behind, celebrating what we bring together. Oh, that was very interesting. And that was uh, Judith Bernstein with Letter to George the Night Before. Um, thanks so much for sharing that, Judith. And where are you calling from? I can't remember. Um, Arroyo Grande, California, which is near San Luis Obispo, California. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad you could call in and, and share a poem, and I hope you do again soon. Sure. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Good night. Night. Yeah, so let's add, um, okay, let's add uh, Judith to our phone book. Oh, don't call Judith. Add her to the phone book. Add contact, and that was uh, Judith Bernstein. And we'll try Brent one more time. If this doesn't work, Brent, I'm just going to um, read your poem, but we'll see. Yeah, still no connection. So I'm not sure what's going on, Brent. But this is Brent's prompt poem. The poem is inspired by my recent move from the Deep South to New England. Oh, cool. Well, congratulations on your move, Brent. I guess maybe that explains why you haven't been on in a while. That's definitely a good reason uh, to be preoccupied having a big move like that. Oh, wait. Now Brent's... Oh, Brent, you called. I almost picked up. Let's try. Oh, it's ringing now. Maybe we can get Brent. Brent! Hello. Ooh. Is it possible? It is possible. Hey, it works. Let me get the screen. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I had to ditch the um ditch the iPad and my headphones and stuff and and go with the phone because uh it just wasn't letting me answer it on the iPad. I don't know why. Yeah, that, that's strange. It was just like dinging like it was waiting to connect, but there was no connection. So it, I don't know. I don't know. A notification would drop down and it would say Rattle is trying to call you. Hmm. Um, update your permissions. Oh, that's weird. And, and so I went into settings and tried to find permissions and and couldn't. <laughs> well, I'm glad. It's great to see. You. It's been it's been a few. I don't know, a month or two, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know the um, the uh, the scheduling shift really threw me for a while. Hmm. Uh, going from Tuesdays to to Sundays. But now my uh, my schedule has uh, caught up and synced with with you guys again, so I'm I'm real happy about that and glad to be back. Oh, very good, me too. So, how are you liking New England? Oh man, it is it is great until it's, the winter um, comes. <laughs> well, <laughs> you um, uh, I I flat out. Uh, state my fear of said winter in the poem that I'm about to read. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Looking forward to hearing it. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Cause, yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to hearing a winter poem. Oh, you know, I moved up to the mountains in California just because I missed the winter, actually. So maybe eventually you'll miss it. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, 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 it's not really the uh, the temperatures dropping that I'm... That, that Well, it. Uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's hear the poem. New England Blues. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, you're ready. Um, New England Blues. You wore your hair down. Stormy clouds over freckled seas flashed with silent silver lightning. Don't be afraid to live in the wind for a while, you said. Believe in your friends. The white crane slept in a corner of that room. You'll ride him soon. Until then... You stay in the South. Up here, though, the red maples love to shed their scarlet letters. All the oaks are lit with yellow fire. They're not afraid of the cold, but I am. From a shadowy room deep in memory, you say, stand still in the quiet woods. Feel the bright, mottled colors of change. Listen for voices. All of creation is a burning bush. Oh, very cool. Love that ending. New England Blues. Thanks so much, Brent. I'm glad we could get connected. Yeah, yeah, me too. Sorry. It was uh, so uh, next next time, hopefully, it'll be hassle-free. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, I'm looking forward to it, Brent. Thanks. Okay. Good Thanks, Tim. Bye. Right, bye-bye. There's Brent Stoffer with New England Blues. And um, let's call up next. Oh, we have uh, Carolyn Codd, too. So we have, um, let me make sure. So we'll do Carla Schwartz, then Carolyn Codd, then Angela Gartner. 
and I think that'll be the, the um, as much as we have time for. I'll, I'll double check. Maybe we can squeeze someone else in too. But let's call up Carla Schwartz. Hello. <laughs> hey, Carla. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Thank you. Still on the lake, still swimming, even Good. though a cold front has come through. Yeah, I bet it's getting pretty cold out there. Yeah, yeah. No, but I'm doing well. And I dug up a um, second person poem, you know, did a little revision on it, but um, it's not brand new. But this one is called Watermelon. Very good. Yeah, go ahead. I have it up whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Okay. You always loved watermelon, the gray pink flesh, the juice that runs down your lips as you bite in. Your heart, big as a watermelon, big as the tractor that pulls the melons off the vines, big as the whole field, as a whole field of watermelons. At the melon umbilical, the um, embarrassed underside, a snail forms pale yellow from a crust from crusty scale. Sorry, that's where the melon blanched under soil as if it grew while the rest of the skin veined like a parasol, sums green at the nib belted in deeper green, like that skirt you wore, like a photographic signature. The melon having lain in the full glory of sun, clown pant stripes down the body, its varicose mappings of brown tributaries. Six eddies of pale seeds, the color of pill bugs divide the flesh. You taught me to chew the seeds instead of spitting. Soft nuts, easy to swallow. In that skirt, your belly would bulge at the waistband until it didn't fit. Until it did again. But then you swam in it. That final year, you shriveled into yourself. Flesh paled and papery, teeth blanched gray refusing to chew or spit, jaws clenched in fear of missing your precious son. A great poem, very touching. That was Watermelon um, by Carla Schwartz. Thanks for sharing that, Carla. Um, and a oh. great example of the you poem, too, where it, um, you know, you feel the intimacy of, of speaking to someone directly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Have a good night. Yep, you too. Again, that was Carla Schwartz with Watermelon. And um, let's go to um, Carolyn Codd. Oh, Carolyn Codd is not connecting. Let's try, um, let's suggest the phone. Maybe we can just do voice over the phone. Hi, Carolyn. It's Tim with Rattle, and you are live on the air. The Skype wouldn't work again, but it suggested to call by phone, so I figured I would call. Yeah, but thank you. I don't know what happened. Yeah, no problem at all. Just, I think I hear myself in the background, yeah. so shut off the stream that you're listening and just talk on the phone. Yeah, yeah I just did. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. And uh, so what did you want to share today? I think I see two poems. Yeah, um, it's actually two versions of, it's a, a first version and a second version, ah. um, if that's okay. <laughs> I wrote the original one about from the autumn prompt, mm -hmm. the prompt about autumn, and it happens to also be um, a you, a you, a second person. Oh, interesting. And so uh, do you want to read both yes. versions? Yeah, the other one, the other version is um, my sister lost her husband of 50 plus years and um, also two other women that I know, and I was thinking about that. And oh, I'm sorry to hear I wrote that. The other yeah. Um, yeah, so sorry I'll to hear that. So go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and read them both. Okay. Um, it's 
entitled Autumn Moods. Um, hazy light of skies with sun, the air calm, but then a breeze. Leaves brightly colored let go and fall. You leave. Days grow shorter, colder, darker. You come back. Wind clears the sky to its vibrant blue. Sunshine bursts out. And then the other version, this is Autumn Moods 2. Hazy light of skies with sun, the air calm, but then a breeze. Leaves brightly colored, let go and fall. With other leavings, some tears. Days grow shorter, colder, darker. Then a thought. I will never leave you or forsake you, he said. Wind clears the sky to its vibrant blue. Sunshine breaks out. Uh, thanks for sharing that pair of poems. Uh, it, it, very touching. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Have a good night. That was Carolyn Codd with uh, Autumn Moods and Autumn Moods 2, a variation. So th- thanks for sharing those, Carolyn. Glad we could get uh, connected. And um, let's see. So I think we will call up. I want to make sure I get to everybody. I did Angela first, so we will try to do Angela last this time, just to be fair. Hi, Tim. Hey, Angela. How are you doing hey, tonight? Angela, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, I think. Let's see. <laughs> okay. So, what do you have to share with us? Well, I have like really two quick ones. The the first, one, I actually did a prompt one, but it's really quick. If I can do that, um, and then my, um, I'll try not to talk too much. Um, I I I have my um, poet's respond poem, which is about a wolf pack in Idaho that was killed. Um, there's actually a, um, a new law in Idaho um, that well, I don't know if it's new. It was signed into law that they could kill 90 percent of the wolves in Idaho, and there's only like 1,500, which I think that's a little crazy. And this uh, wolf pack, these wolf pups, I'm sorry, were killed. And these high schoolers were following them and they discovered the den was empty and they found out that um, they were all gone. And it's just to me, I can't imagine a world without a wolf's howl because I grew up with a wolf hybrid and our family's always been in a wolves. And I just I think it speaks to the bigger problem of how we manage wildlife in our country and and how, you know, with the deer population blooming, I always think, you know, I mean, (sighs) there's a there's a cycle there's a reason why animals are around and 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 you know we need to learn to coexist with them yeah i totally agree and um i'm I'm not going to talk much because i'm getting a weird echo actually no it's gone it fixed okay (laughs) so um we're ready to go like normal but why don't you go ahead and read this i remember it from the uh from the submissions another very a sad story um why don't you go ahead and, and read that the day her wolf pups were shot the day her wolf pups were shot I see her long legs jogging between the pines. Blood is on her muzzle from the deer's open throat. It's food for her children. She left them sleeping soundly in the warm mountain den. She let out a long howl to warn the others. The next generation is lost. She keeps going. Her ancestors are whimpering. Yeah, just very sad to to hear that story about the... I I didn't know that they could be hunting wolves um, like that. It's sad, sad to hear. Yeah, for sure. And then, my my uh, other one's really quick. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. They're both short. They they are. It, yeah, it's a um, it's a second person. This I don't usually write second person, so this was kind of my. And of course, it's kind of gloomy. Sorry. <laughs> okay. When you are buried, there are black rings on four of your fingers. One is magic. You believe in its future's hand, doom, happiness, forgiveness. What do you see? Nothing. Your flesh is wilting and falling off the bone. A crippling stillness in the dark. Beneath your filled in grave, emptiness fills your eyes. Forgotten in a hundred years by people who are yours. Another sad poem, but thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. It's a, <laughs> it's a pleasure to hear hear both of them. Well, thanks, Tim. Have a great week. Yeah, you too. Great to see you. Have a good night.
You too. Bye. Angela Gartner with uh, When You Were Buried and The Day Her Wolf Pups Were Shot. Yeah, thanks for sharing those, Angela. It really is always a pleasure. And uh, we got a phone call from Phil Stern um, just now. So let's call Phil, too. Phil sent a poem in. Oh. Hey Phil, how you doing tonight? I think I hear myself in the background, so so mute that and then we'll we'll talk. I think I did. Okay, good. I, yeah, I don't hear it anymore. Thanks. So, how are you doing tonight, Phil? Good, thank you. Very interesting uh, session tonight. I enjoyed, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I thought so too. Uh, so, what did you want to share to my fellow elder emerging poets? Yeah, um, when I first started writing poetry again, I kept seeing the phrase "emerging poets." So I've been uh, revising this poem ever since. <laughs> <laughs> it's a you poem, but of course I'm really talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how you poems usually go. I'm looking forward to this. Let, let's hear it whenever you're ready, Philip. Okay. To my fellow elder emerging poets, are you then an ancient groundhog like me, half out of burrow, eyeing the glare? fearful of cold air and sparse greenery? Or have you been, like me, a shaggy old sated caterpillar, now sitting tentative in chrysalis, eager to open soon silk-veined wings? Dear fearful one, emerge and gift us with your sharp teeth, excavating claws and special knowledge of darkness. Or tentative one, surprise us with your unpredictable flight path, your quiet trembling over bodied fragrances, your bold eloquence in blue and orange and black and gold. Oh, excellent poem to my fellow elder emerging poets. Thanks so much for sharing that, Philip. Yeah, I want to say one thing, sure. Tim. Um, uh, I just want to thank you for providing an environment that is uh, so inviting. Oh, it's making really, it's it really easier, my pleasure. yeah. You know, and, and this poem, of course, expresses some of the fears, you know, about exposing oneself, <laughs> taking risks. Yeah, well, I'm so, so glad uh, that you do. It's always a pleasure to hear your poems, Philip. And uh, you know, it was interesting. We had a meeting picking poems over the weekend, and the 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 um um the theme of um of aging and sort of being a young elder you know emerging poet kind of came up a lot in the poems we were looking at just ha ha as it happened this week it was interesting to see so um thanks for sharing this i think it's an important one okay thank you yeah have a good night philip you too bye. okay bye it's uh, philip stern once again with to my elder our fellow elder emerging poets and um I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody who might be waiting for a phone call. Let me just bear with me while I scroll up and make sure that we covered everybody. Um, okay, I think we did. So there was another... Let me see what else we have sent in here. Um, this is uh, Clayton Clark, who I know was here earlier. She must have had to leave. Um, yeah, she said, I wish I could join in tonight, but I can't. I'll be dropping in and out, and then for good, I'll have to listen to the whole thing later. If there's time, I would love you to read my poem. It's a first-ish messy draft from today, so there's that. Uh, what the poem's about, I was shocked to find in writing the poem and having to leave things out. My subconscious sent me into a very tough time on my son, um, one of my sons went through. So this is uh, Once They Were His Friends by Clayton Clark. So let me read this for everybody. Once they were his friends. They had all stood together, time after time, eating snacks outside English lit, cracking jokes as if they were one, many, tentacled being. Then surprise came from these people, one crisp fall day. They decided to turn him away, no words, no reason given. So hard to be shunned, he stood alone, cut off, rejected that season. He wondered, had his clothes been wrong? Had he said something offensive, what made them turn against him? Closed off, he looked in every crack he could find. Would he ever be able, at least, to caulk his endless oozing wound? He sat alone in his blue room until music befriended him, seeped into every pore of his skin, rivering through bones and marrow. 
his senses fed by rhythmical rhymes. In time, he kicked out trepidation, ignored defamation, grew stronger in his chrysalis stage of hibernation. When he merged, purged, mouthful of snap-crackling words, new friends came around for the sounds. They picked up pearls dropped from his tongue, but he made sure to keep his glass wings well hidden. Oh, very good. Great poem. That was Once They Were His Friends uh, by Clayton Clark. And um, I love the, the rhythms and the, and the rhymes that are going on there. A lot of, it was a fun poem to read. So thanks for sharing that, Clayton. And um, let me find another poem. So, okay, that was a, um, let's do... Um, Susan Lipson sent a poem. Um, she says, uh, My poem, Bomb Diffuser, addresses the uncle for whom I was named, who I never met, because he blew up with a bomb he was diffusing in world, during World War II. The connection I have always felt to him was fed by readings with my dad, his little brother, who kept a box full of his poetic wartime letters that we occasionally read together. His effect on my dad's and my life as it relates to our relationships with my mother is the subject of this poem pasted below. And um, here, this is a bomb diffuser. Let me put it in a word what doc. Well, actually, I can just read it here. This is um, Bomb Diffuser by Susan L. Lipson. Your purple heart displayed on my dad's wall your stack of letters, loving, wrapped, and stored, and the fact that my dad cherished and admired you made me feel honored to bear your initials, uncle, hopeful to be worthy of honor and admiration myself, and inspired to inherit a fraction of your courage. You dodged explosives and diffused massive bombs, so you must find it ironic that your little brother married a human bomb, whom he never diffused, just triggered and then dodged, leaving his little soldiers, me and my siblings, to endure her con continual combustion, her booms, her booby traps, her shrapnel, our scars. But don't fault your younger brother for his lack of courage. He did still empower me, even if unwittingly as I grew up, by reading your letters with me, and then leaving your letters for me making me feel connected to and inspired by your courage, your resilience, your pragmatic view of life and death, and your ability to disconnect the altar and alter fate. After decades, my mother's verbal attacks, after decades of my mother's verbal attacks, my, after my dad left to meet you, I finally channeled your bomb demolition skills, severed the hot connection that jolted me through childhood, and marched away triumphantly from her battlefield, as you wrote, after having rendered a bomb as powerless as an old water heater. She can no longer make me boil. Oh, very interesting poem. That was Susan L. Lipson uh, with Bomb Diffuser. Um, yeah, a great letter, a very interesting insight. Thanks for sharing that, Susan. And I think we're going to have to, um, we have a few people who sent poems in, but we're pretty much out of time. Um, for the show, let me just really quickly do the uh, Saiku for today. And the Saiku was, I don't even remember, what was it about? Oh, yeah. So this was um, the article um, that I was looking at right here. This is um, Sense of Smell is Our Most Rapid Warning System. Um, the ability to detect and react to the smell of a potential threat is a pre precondition of our and other mammals' survival. Using a novel technique, researchers have been able to study what happens in the brain when the central nervous system judges a smell to represent danger. The study indicates that negative smells associated with unpleasantness or unease are processed earlier than positive smells and trigger a physical avoidance response. And so what's interesting, there's a kind of a negativity bias is a famous you know, of the psychological biases. And we have a negative negativity bias in our sense of smell. And negative, dangerous smells are processed unconsciously very rapidly in, in um, 100 to 150 milliseconds, it says down here. And so that is uh, the article that I was reading today that inspired this psyche. And also an actual hike through the woods that we had on Friday afternoon. And um, here is the quick psyche. Another trail, downwind of the dumpsters, 
bear scat. Another trail downwind of the dumpsters bear scat. That is your Saiku for today. And uh, it's true, we were hiking up um, a new trail we'd never been on. And um, you could smell the garbage from the dumpsters. It's a very heavily populated mountain that people climb up. But we found this other trail that I'd never been on going down. And um, it was just full of bear scat <laughs> in a way that was kind of creepy. And you could tell that like at least once a week, the bears come for their uh, their buffet <laughs> and that uh, in that parking lot. So that was uh, the Saiku for today. And the prop for next week is going to be this. A ballad is a music-based poem that tells a story. This form isn't especially complicated, but does have very specific requirements. Um, WebExhibits.org has great instructions on how to write your own ballad. Oops, this is kind of, there we go. Um, if you Google Web Exhibits and Ballad, WebExhibits.org's Make Your Own Ballad page will be the first hit. Um, the Lady of Shalott by Alfred Tennyson and Casey at the Bat by Ernest Thayer are examples of ballad poems. So that is your prompt for next week. Write a ballad. Uh, that's a music-based poem that tells a story. And um, that should be a fun one. And hopefully Megan and I will get, get poems done. We'll get back on the ball and uh, share some with you too next week. And uh, next week's guest is going to be Jenny Chi. Um, Jenny is a cancer researcher. Um, she wasn't in the scientist poets issue, but she is a scientist poet. And uh, her new book, her first full-length book, Focal Point, just came out. Um, it's getting a lot of praise. I see it all over the place. The, the marketing for this book is doing really well too. And um, Jenny's a really interesting person. I'm really looking forward to talking to her. That is Rattlecast number 115. Uh, with Jenny Chi, and uh, the once again, her book is Focal Point, the regular time, Sunday, October 24th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Good night. <laughs>